Good morning, Connect Church. All right. Are y'all glad to be here today? Amen. We are glad you're here. Let's stand together. We're going to worship our Lord today, okay? I love singing songs that are straight from Scripture. And this song right here comes out of Psalm 92. Let's lift our voice together in worship. It is good to praise the Lord. Sing it. It is good. That's how it goes. 
out. Terry's got some video announcements for us, and uh, it's going to take a little while, so y'all pay attention, all right? Hey, Connect Church, we want to welcome you to our services today. I'm Terry Pierce, the lead pastor. I'm currently not in the building. Uh, I'm in Missouri this morning. Tell you a little bit about that in just a second. So we've got a lot of things to cover today. So hang on, and uh, we're going to get through this real quickly. Pull out your guest cards uh, right now for all of you that are very first time uh, coming to our church. Uh, go to the red tables after first service, after second service. Take those cards to our guest services desk. We are thrilled to have you. Pull them out of the seat back uh, pocket cover there. Fill those cards out uh, or pick them up at the red tables and uh, we are thrilled to have you. We love seekers here at Connect Church and we want to welcome you. Come back next Sunday. I'll be in the Gospel of Luke chapter 21 and uh, I'd love to meet you. Uh, otherwise, uh, for the rest of our folks that are here today, remind you in your bulletin cards, you got those handy, uh, be sure and check out for all of our new people that are interested in knowing about our church. We've had about uh, 80 to 100 of you that are brand new just in the last few months. Uh, new members class and so we're going to take an hour next Sunday, uh, maybe an hour and 15 minutes. We're going to feed you lunch and we're going to tell you all about our church. Uh, there's no obligation. You don't have to sign your life away to, you know, you're buying a condo. Uh, we just want you to come and uh, you're going to find out more about Connect Church, hear from all the staff, our wives, and uh, meet the families and just tell you the mission and the purpose of what we're doing here. And then you make a decision, you know, what you want to do with that. So, uh, and it's free, but you've got to get signed up today online. And uh, that is narrowing that window to get signed up. So uh, be sure and do that. Uh, also, uh, be sure and check out in your uh, bulletin card about Holly is going to be uh, doing a trunk or treat uh, at the end of the month. And so be sure and uh, help her out and you can see Holly for details about that. Uh, so uh, Blynn and I are here today in Missouri. And real quickly, just uh, give you, we're going to share with you more and probably get a video that we'll produce on our page this week on our Facebook page. But uh, we're here in Missouri this morning with Alvin Lisa Thomas, the satellite campus that uh, started as a house church here and we're excited to announce to you today that last night Lynn and I went uh, with them to the YMCA and they're going to be renting a uh, building or a room there in the YMCA and they're going to launch uh, their own church. Uh, they're going to move it out of the house and they're going to be doing that next March and that's going to go in right before Easter and so I'm here to sort of help them get through that and uh, figure out what that looks like today and so my first time to be with Alan and Lisa uh, there in Missouri and it's exciting and uh, meeting them and sharing with them that vision for the future. So we love what God is doing through Connect Church. Another reason you're giving is we're making a difference. And then, which leads us to a uh, real quick story, testimony, and I know we got to go, uh, but uh, uh, we, we had a tremendous, spontaneous um, uh, prayer service this past Wednesday night while we're taking communion and doing our here journals, praying over uh, these things and what God is doing here. Uh, we had a teenager get saved in the teen service while Andy was preaching. Uh, Taylor had another one that wants to get Get baptized in the college age group and so we love what God is doing which just leaves us into what we're going to do tonight. God is moving here. Join us for a night of worship in the round with Tanner and we need to give God glory and praise. It's going to be at six o'clock here tonight and finally that leads us into the guy that you're going to hear from today. He's a personal friend. He's really old uh, but we've been around each other together for a long time. Uh, he is currently leading a discipleship making movement in Africa you're going to hear basically three things today. You're going to hear about discipleship making. You're going to hear about Africa and what God is doing. And you're going to hear about people of peace. So listen for those three things from James. Otherwise, Andrew's going to take it from here and tell you more about uh, what's going on here at Connect Church. Have a great sermon. Well, good morning, Connect Church family. Hey, look at you guys doing great with the response. Uh, good morning, guys. Uh, I don't have any time to tell you about anything going on because Terry took 17 minutes on the announcement video. We're actually just going to pray and send you on your way. No, thank you guys for being here this morning. Uh, we have a, an exciting service. You guys, we have a guest speaker. His name is uh, Mr. James Fourlines. He leads a ministry called Final Command Ministries that goes all throughout Africa. He's going to tell you um, about what his, uh, his whole ministry is, but he's also just going to tell you uh, church today. I, I don't know about y'all, but I am really pumped. I've had a lot of coffee and I've had a lot of Holy Spirit. That is just a dangerous combination altogether. Um, he's going to tell us about some of the incredible things that are going on, not just through his ministry, um, but just the way that when we let the Holy Spirit lead our lives, guys, 
When we are sensitive and we are open and responsive to what the Holy Spirit wants to do, not just in this place, but in our lives each and every day, it is life-giving, it's life-changing. And it's absolutely incredible. I forgot this first service. I've had four people already remind me and text me. So I'm going to make sure I remind you. If this is your first time visiting, we are glad that you are here. My name is Andrew. I'm the student pastor here. Uh, like Brother Terry said, he's in Missouri uh, preaching and visiting with them. I don't know if they're watching online today or going to watch later, but uh, Brother Terry is out there visiting with them. I do want to remind you that we do have two main ways to give. You can come up to the offering boxes right up here um, and just give your tithes and offerings to uh, kind of give to not only to things that you're going to hear about today with James, but also to just what we are doing as a church. Uh, Terry alluded to it. We had an incredible services Wednesday. And if I can just share one quick thing real quick with you guys, um, just in full transparency, we were supposed to have a bonfire Wednesday night for the teenagers. It was fall break. Didn't think anybody was going to be here. We're going to have a bonfire. We're going to burn some couches, all the good redneck things. It got canceled because there's a burn ban uh, going on. So we were like, all right, we'll go to the ballpark. Let's just play some baseball, kickball, give a devotion. It's going to be good. And out of irony of all irony, it got rained out during a burn ban. Okay, so try and figure that one out. And I text our youth team. I was like, should we, should we just tell all of them to go to the adult service? Like, we can just go. They're going to have communion. It'll be good. And our youth team was like, I think, I think you still just need to do your devotion. It'll be abbreviated. We'll get out on time, Mike. Uh, you know, it'll be shorter and everything else. Y'all, I had two students come up to me and say they want to be baptized. And I got to lead a girl to the Lord. Simply because we were, yeah, that's worth praising, not because of me. Absolutely nothing I shared. Y'all, it was about experience in Jesus. Like this is, it was nothing new. And yet the Holy Spirit knew something that I did not know. Church, God is moving. And so when you're giving, we're not just saying giving to us or giving to even just James. You are giving to the, literally the, the fruits of the gospel, the lives being changed, and it's happening. We don't talk about it. We live it and we get to experience. We're going to have baptisms lined up. Uh, God is working in our college ministry. It is incredible. And so if you want to learn more about what we are as a church, I do want to remind you too, we have a connection card. You can scan that QR code. We'll tell you a little bit more about ourselves. We do have a new members lunch coming up where you can find out all that information and more. I do want to remind you one more thing real quickly too, is that we do have a worship night. And church, let me tell you this. You're about to hear about the work of the Holy Spirit that is changing lives, not just in Africa, as I didn't even realize today until first service, but how people in Africa are changing the church in America through, for, through the Holy Spirit, through the work of the gospel. It's absolutely incredible. You're going to be so blessed by the word that Brother James is going to give to us. But... I also want to remind you that we get to celebrate not just the Holy Spirit presence through this service. We're going to come back tonight, this evening at 6 o'clock, right? 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock is going to be called Worship in the Round. I think we're going to move some of these chairs and stuff yep. out of this way. We're going to set the vibe for you. <clears throat> um, but no, we're just going to go to the throne of worship. And church, you don't want to miss it. Tanner and the worship team is just going to be leading us through some scripture, through some songs, a time to worship our Lord and Savior. Church, that's what we're here for, right? Y'all forgot I like interaction. That's what we're here for, right, church? Yeah. Amen. Let's go. Absolutely. Guys, I want to pray over you guys so we can just be in tune with the Holy Spirit and what he wants for us today. God, we thank you so much for being here. Father, I was, I was literally moved to tears. I was motivated. I was challenged. I was convicted. And God, just as James just so clearly communicated, I was humbled this morning through the first service. God, I thank you for what James does. I thank you for his ministry. I thank you for raising up leaders, God, that this world is so much bigger than Tupelo, Mississippi. But God, you haven't forgotten about us either. You want to use the people that are under the sound of my voice currently right now and tons of people that are gathered all over the city this morning. You want to use us to change the world. And God, we don't have to be the best. We don't have to be the most educated. We don't have to have all the right answers. Holy Spirit, we just need you. So God, tune our hearts, open our minds. I know we come in here. Lord, I, I wrestle toddlers. I have so many distractions, it seems like sometimes when I'm walking into the doors of these church, but God, may we focus solely upon you for our families, for our marriages, 
for our workplaces, for our schools, for all of it. God, you are doing incredible things. We want to join you in your movement. God, may your spirit rest upon this service today. May you be glorified through our worship. You deserve all the glory, all the honor, all the praise because you are powerful. You are mighty. You are wonderful. And you're going to move in the hearts of people today. And it's in the mighty, amazing, powerful name of Jesus, I pray. In church, we all said, Amen.
your name is the highest and your name is the greatest and that your name stands above them all. And God, I hope the truth of those words are hidden in our heart this morning. That we truly believe what we're singing when we sing, God, you are above everything. The good, the bad. God, you are worthy of it all. For from you are all things and to you are all things, God. You are so worthy and we stand in all of your presence this morning. God, we ask you to move in a mighty way, in a way that only you can. And we give this service to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen, church. Thank you for your singing. You can be seated. Would y'all give Brother James four lines a hand as he comes to bring the message today? As we're getting set up here, um, last night I got in and um, thank you. Tanner took me out to dinner with Sadie and Hallie, their two girls. And so I um, had some blue jeans and a shirt on, and I said, okay, tomorrow I could wear this. I've got a dress shirt I can wear with it. I said, but hold on a second. And I went to the restroom, and I came out in this. I said, or I could wear this. They said, that, wear that. <laughs> I was freaking the people out in the restaurant. They were wondering, why is this man in his pajamas in the restaurant? <laughs> It's all right. I don't mind embarrassing Tanner. That's all right. Um, thank you for the opportunity of being here and sharing with you what God is doing. Certainly been praying that the power of the Holy Spirit would speak to you. Um, really what, what we'd like to accomplish uh, is nothing that I can do. I don't have the capacity to speak to you, but the Holy Spirit does. Uh, he knows you and he knows your name. And he can speak to you. And uh, I would just say this. If during this time the Holy Spirit speaks to you, then um, afterwards I'd like to talk with you about it. Okay? Let's make that deal. There's one thing I want to get across during this morning. Just one thing. I want to be able to share with you, if you are not really aware of this already, that the kingdom is expanding around the world in some of the most difficult contexts you could imagine. It's happening. And I want to share with you a little bit about how that's happening. There's two things as a result of that truth that I'd like to I've been praying that the Holy Spirit would speak to you about. Number one, you can be involved in what God is doing in some of the most difficult areas of the world. Number two, um, there are some lessons I believe that the church in the U.S needs to learn from what is happening in movements globally. There are some incredible movements of God, some significant kingdom advance, which is happening right now as we live and breathe. There's really only three places that the gospel is not really seeing con some very significant kingdom advance. That's in the United States, in Western Europe, and in Australia. Pretty much everywhere else, there's some significant kingdom advance. And I really think we need to learn some lessons from what is happening there that can speak into our context um, here in the United States. If we don't find a way for the church to penetrate spiritual darkness, if we don't find a way we could lose our culture in the next generation. Um, and it's not, it's not going to be simply by finding ways for people to come to our church. Most of them are checked out already. They're not coming. 
we're going to have to find a way to go to where they are. And those are some of the lessons I hope that we can learn. But one simple truth to share with you some incredible things that God is doing. Um, Luke says, everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Um, May through the power of the Holy Spirit, we see remarkable things today. Uh, In recent times, even within the last week or so, we have been exposed to some incredible brutality, uh, this time in Israel by the hands of Hamas, um, a Muslim Palestinian people group there. And um, I know that for those of us who, um, the, the U.S. Is, is the cultural context the emotions when you talk about Islam or Muslims can be anger and fear. Um, I'd really like to challenge that. Um, There is no reason for fear um, because God is doing some incredible things in Islam. You're not going to hear this on the news. And unless you're dealing with people who are working among Muslims globally, you're probably not going to hear it at all. But I want to introduce you to two books. Um, One on the right is by a friend of mine, David Garrison. Uh, They spent about five years researching movements of Muslims to faith in Jesus around the world. Garrison describes a movement as within a people group, they have their own language and culture, There are 100 churches planted or 1,000 baptized believers within a five-year period of time, I think. This movement, um, and he looks at what he calls nine houses of Islam, nine different geographical regions. We work in three of those houses in Africa, houses of Islam, geographical regions. Uh, Let me just say about that, He starts with Muhammad. Muhammad was born in the seventh century, started working in the early 600s, and founded Islam. Uh, And he traces century by century how many movements have there been um, each century. And starting with the seventh, the eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth. 18th, 12 centuries, over a millennium. If my memory serves me correctly, in research, he could only find four movements of Muslims to faith in Jesus in 1,200 years. In the 19th century, I think there were maybe about four to six. In the 20th century, the second half of the 20th century, there were 11. Since the year 2000, the 21st century, he was writing, and this book came out in 2015, I think that he says in there, my memory was there's around 60 to 70 movements in the first 15 years. Since then, that number is now over 200 movements. 200 different locations among people groups. And sometimes it's not just 1,000 baptized believers. In some of them, it's tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands. There are more Muslims who have come to faith in Jesus Christ from the year 2000 to now than there were from the year 2000 all the way back to Muhammad by a factor of 10. You are living in an age that is unprecedented in the history of the church. It's happening right now. Um, I think that that's part of the signs of the times that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. We know about wars and rumors of wars. We see that. All we have to do is turn on television 
pestilences, earthquakes, those things are going to happen. But then he says this in verse 14, the Olivet Discourse, he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Then the end will come. We can't understand that the end will come when we finish the task. Every people group, that word nations there is the Greek word ethne, where we get our word ethnic group. So it's not geopolitical nations like Canada or Mexico. It's ethnic groups. And the church is zeroing in on that and is reaching many of these Muslim people groups. We'll be talking about some of that this morning. But I want you to be encouraged that he said he would build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And it's true. The other book, Miraculous Movements, is by one of our founders of our organization, a dear friend and mentor of mine, Jerry Trousdale. The subtitle is How Hundreds of Thousands of Muslims Are Falling in Love with Jesus. Uh, It's talking about, in sub-Saharan Africa, these movements in sub-Saharan Africa We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Africa is very unique. Um, It's the only place in the world where this context happens. The white areas are predominantly Christian. The green areas are predominantly Muslim. Um, We have sent missionaries from the United States and other countries to Africa for about 200 years. I've got good news. It worked! Um, There are 180 million evangelical Bible-believing Christians on the continent of Africa. That's as many as North America, where we live, and South America combined. There are more evangelical Christians on this continent than any continent on earth. There are also 450 million Muslims. That's the green. And um, uh, nowhere on earth does, does Islam meet Christianity face to face. In most everywhere else in the world, it's one or the other. North America, the strength of Christianity. South America, the strength of Christianity. Europe, the strength of Christianity. In many ways, it's somewhat fossilized Christianity, but still Christianity. Even Russia, the Russian Orthodox Church, is a Christian church. Um, The Arabian Peninsula is Islam. Central Asia, Islam. Middle East, Islam. You don't see the strength of Christianity meeting the strength of Islam, except here in Africa. And it meets in a region that's called the Sahel, S-A-H-E-L. And having spent a lot of time in the Sahel, in that region of Africa, it is as hot as the Sahel. Um, This is the Sahel a region that stretches across the southern part of the Saharan Desert. We don't really understand how big the Sahara Desert is. You can fit all of the United States of America, including Alaska, and still have room in the Sahara Desert. The continent of Africa is massive. It doesn't really show that on our maps. But if you start in Dakar and Senegal on the farthest western coast and you were to fly to the Horn of Africa on the east, it would take you nine hours. You can get from here to Europe in nine hours. Um, It is like Los Angeles to New York is about four hours, a little over. You're only halfway across Africa. It's a massive continent and it is where the battle is raging. Just to go back this for just a second, those red spots are major terrorist operational organizations, Al-Shabaab over in Somalia, Boko Haram, the Fulani herdsmen, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, 
uh, JNIM. There's a lot of terrorism. In fact, there's more terrorism that's happening in this region than any region in the world. We don't hear that much about it on the news because we don't have a lot of economic interest in the Sahel. But I promise you, if you want to have a greater conversation about that afterwards, please come up to me afterwards. I'll be right over there and let's talk about it. It is really a challenging environment. Um, Twelve years ago, we partnered with a ministry in Sierra Leone. I will be shocked if anyone knows where Sierra Leone is. Um, it's a small country in Africa on the western coast. Um, population maybe a little more than Mississippi, maybe about the population of Tennessee perhaps. Um, but in that country, there's a ministry called New Harvest Ministries. The leader of that ministry is Shadonke Johnson. Um, he's the one standing beside me, and I'm the one on the far right, in case you were wondering. Um, this was about 12 years ago. My hair wasn't quite as gray as it is now. And uh, we were sending these guys out as coordinators for disciple-making movements into the Sahel, into Senegal, Mauritania, Niger, Chad. And uh, because there has been some incredible movements of God in Sierra Leone. It is amazing. I've taken so many teams to Sierra Leone to see what's happening there. There's a, a church from Knoxville, Tennessee that's, I'm leaving Sunday. I'll be going to Nigeria, and, uh, and uh, which is, by the way, this is Nigerian dress like on a Sunday morning. Um, and uh, then I'll be going to Sierra Leone to meet that church. And there's a lot of ministries, a lot of nonprofits that are bringing people to see this movement that's happening in Sierra Leone. It's amazing. They've seen over 6,000 churches planted among Muslim people groups. Every people group in their country. Oh, I wish I had time to tell you stories. But um, we started partnering with them um, in 2012. Um, actually, the end of 2011. And they're Sierra Leone. Uh, today, we now have 153 partners across the Sahel and into North Africa in that conflict zone. Um, uh, just Africa is affecting the United States in a very positive way. Let me give you one example and then I'll tell you a little bit more about Shidanke. Um, I don't know if you've followed this at all, but maybe you've heard little snippets of things within the Methodist Church in the United States. Uh, I don't know if you know, the Methodist is a connectional denomination, not like this where every, this church owns your property. You know, the church owns the property and everything. But in a connectional government, the denomination owns it. You as people who attend, you don't. All of you could decide you don't like what's happening in the denomination and decide we want to leave. And they'd say, fine, leave then you'd have to leave the building because the building is not yours. Even everybody in, it's the building's not yours. So there's been, a, there's been a, a challenge over the last couple of decades because there's more Methodist in Africa than anywhere in the world. And when you come to global meetings within the, Af within the Methodist church, they can outvote people. They can outvote the United States. Well, there's been a drift, some of a moral and cultural drift within the United Methodist Church. And I'm not trying to be unkind here. It's just the reality as it relates to moral issues of homosexuality and gender, things along that line. They really want to go and perform gay marriages and everything along that line. It's just the reality. But they haven't been able to because the global Methodist Church can outvote them. So the official position of the Methodist Church has been... A, opposing gay marriage, even though here in the United States, a large swath of it really wants to. Well, then it becomes really a problem globally. So the global church, mainly led by the Africans, came up with a deal. We will split. We will go our separate ways, and then you can pass whatever you want to in your group. But you have to allow 
Every Methodist church in the United States who doesn't want to do that, you have to allow them to leave. And you have to allow them to keep their property. Ah, there are thousands of Methodist churches in the United States right now. If you've not been, you can Google this and you can read all you want to read about it. They have been able to vote as a congregation. There's a process they have to go through, but they can vote here in Mississippi. There are churches that are able to leave and leave with their property. Thanks to the Africans. I promise you in Africa, there is no debate on this issue. Not in the church. Not at all. They're not having debates and votes about it. They have a very strong biblical understanding of family and all of those relationships. So praise God for the things that are happening because of Africans back here in the United States. And I think we need to be listening to the church outside of the United States. And I do want to transition that to make a connection to Shidanke. Some of you, at least the older of you, will remember a guy named Chuck Colson. He's with the Lord now. But he was an advisor to President Nixon. He actually was caught up in the Watergate scandal, which caused President Nixon to have to resign. The only president in U.S. history to ever resign in Watergate. Chuck Colson was one that was sentenced to prison. He was a lawyer. He was an attorney, very high up in the political world world but he was sentenced to prison in prison he met Jesus he became a very ardent follower of Jesus he came out of prison and with his influence and connectedness he started an incredible movement of people toward a Christian worldview he created the Colson Center for Christian worldview and in the last 30 years 25 years of the last century he was one of evangelicals greatest scholars writing a lot of books and different things along that line every year they have a conference and at the conference they give an award it's called the William Wilberforce Award that was named after a member of Parliament in Britain William Wilberforce who was a godly Christian man who led the Parliament of the UK in Britain to abolish slavery in 1807, a generation or two before we did here in the United States. Very godly man in changing and shaping culture. Uh, so they give an award called the William Wilberforce Award globally to someone who has impacted with a Christian worldview in their culture. Uh, they meet for three days. They met the 18th, 19th, and 20th of May in Indianapolis. This is the smartest group of people I have ever been around. They're university professors. They're medical people who are dealing with medical ethics issues. They're politicians. There are, um, and they were giving the William Wilberforce Award to Shadonke Johnson, a friend of mine and um, for his work in Sierra Leone. And Shadanke called and asked me if I would be a part of introducing him at the dinner for him to receive that award. And um, this is how I introduced him. In his book, The Next Christendom, The Coming of Global Christianity, Philip Jenkins quotes Andrew Walls, the Scottish expert, who said this, anyone who wishes to undertake a serious study of Christianity these days needs to know something about Africa, end quote. I would say yes and amen. We are fortunate tonight to be honoring how God has used an African leader to do above and beyond all that we could ask or think. Much more could be said than we have time for, how God has used Shadanke and his team to transform the country. Schools, medical and dental clinics, water projects, seed banks, community development, efforts to eradicate FGM, and unprecedented outreaches during Ebola. Thousands of churches have been planted. Tens of thousands of ordinary people are becoming disciple makers and church planters. Ordinary people. 
teachers, farmers, students, military, ex-convicts, former imams, taxi drivers, and soccer players. We simply don't have time. So I would like to take just a moment to describe the most impactful realization God has used Shadanke to create in me. A true paradigm shift in thinking. And I hope a challenge to us all to humbly seek to learn lessons from the global south. This may be crucial in our difficult context in seeing breakthroughs in the strongholds that imperil our culture and society. Africa is the only place in the world where the strength of Christianity from the south is meeting the strength of Islam from the north face to face. It is a tinderbox, volatile, unpredictable, a true clash of cultures. Do you, do you notice any familiar language to our context? In the middle of all of this, some of the most incredible kingdom advances are happening. The book Miraculous Movements chronicles some of what God is doing, and many of these stories are from Sierra Leone. God has taught me some life-changing lessons in Africa by contrast. Contrasting decades of my own personal ministry with what I was seeing with my own eyes. Over the last 12 years, I have observed how God is moving miraculously among some of the most hostile Muslim people groups in the world. I contrast that with the moral decay we see in our cultural context here, and I wonder. When I look back over difficult times in my ministry, setbacks, not meeting budgets, falling short of goals. What was my response? I have to be honest. I just worked harder. I read more books, called in more consultants, arranged more meetings, attended more conferences, went back and got more training. None of these are bad in themselves, and God certainly may use them in our lives, but that is not what I, I have observed in African leaders like Shidanke. They pray and fast and listen to God. And when he speaks to them, and he truly speaks to them, they really do believe that they can say to a mountain, be removed into the midst of the sea. Oh, how I wish we could have a long discussion. But I will give one example for context. In the beginnings of what is now a, tr a true movement in Sierra Leone, Shidanke received a letter from the country president of the Muslim Youth League. He communicated to Shidanke that he would never be satisfied until he heard that Shidanke was dead. Today, that man is a disciple maker, a church planter, and a member of parliament. I know him. I've tried to think of some example in our cultural context that might illustrate how unlikely and miraculous that is. And I came up with this. It is like Bob Iger of Disney supporting Ron DeSantis for president. Can we really see something like that happen? Shidanke believes that we can. The reality to which God has opened my eyes is this. It is not in our education, not our strategic plans, not in a SWOT analysis, not in hiring just the right person, not in our hard work, and not even in a successful fundraising campaign that we will see kingdom advances where now there are strongholds and pervasive spiritual darkness. It is simple. It is profound. It is as we truly humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. There are persons of peace right now, persons of peace right now in this community, and they will be receptive. People with whom God is dealing, but you can't imagine he would be dealing with them. Right now, in the U.S., they are hardline radical secularists. 
They are among the faculty of Ivy League universities. They are in the boardrooms of left-wing media and in the hearts of the LBGT community. We can do far more than win the argument with them. God can win them to himself. The miracles begin when God opens our eyes to where he is working and we join him in it. And when God miraculously intervenes in their lives, truly miraculously, in their own astonishment, they will say, who he is, I do not know. All I know is once I was blind and now I see. That's what we need. We need for God to work in ways among people who are totally resistant to everything that we believe in. They're totally resistant to it all. But when God moves in their lives in a miraculous way, the only thing they will be able to say was this was the finger of God. In conclusion, several years ago, in one of our discussions late at night at the Mount Pleasant Guest House in Beau, Sierra Leone, Shidanke and I were talking about the church in the United States. And Shadanke prays every day for a movement of God here in the U.S. He's, he's been here in the U.S. many, many, many times. He said, James, what I've observed in the U.S. is that if pastors and leaders cannot see a way that they can accomplish something, they don't even think God can. Shadanke, thank you for truly believing that God is the impossibility specialist and convincing me of that as well. This is Shidanke and me that evening. The president of Sierra Leone, this is from a newspaper in Sierra Leone, a website, has, um, has appointed Shidanke as a Peace Commission chairman to bring about reconciliation in the country. Um, we need a lot of reconciliation in our country, would to God, it would be a godly leader like Shadanke that would lead it. It is simple. Um, what I've observed reminds me of what I read in the New Testament and early church history. Basic biblical principles that somehow we have overlooked. It starts with prayer and fasting. I think any significant movement of God that does not start there is faulty from the get-go. We don't even know what we're supposed to do. Paul says our eyes cannot see and our ears cannot hear, nor can even enter the human heart. The things that God has prepared for those that love him, but they are revealed by his spirit. He prays for the church in Ephesus that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of their understanding being enlightened, that they may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of that mighty power that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. He is praying that the very same power that raised Jesus from the dead is applied to our efforts to expand his kingdom. That's what we need. That will never happen in our own strength. It will never happen no matter how many committee meetings we have. It will not happen except when we pray and fast and listen to God. This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting, Jesus said. When we pray and fast, God's going to lead us to where he's already working. We don't have to worry about it. He's, it's not our job. It's not our job. It's his. He'll lead us to where he's working. When he leads us, we need to serve these people. Jesus was a servant. The night before he was crucified, he took off his outer garment. He knelt down in front of his disciples and the creator of all that is washed their feet. Why? We can't win the world unless we serve the world. We need to be serving the world. In Africa, that may be water projects where there is no water. It may be education. It may be medical, dental, agricultural, all the things that Shidanke is doing. But you're not just doing them to do good. You're doing them because you're looking for somebody. 
That's Luke 10. There's a person of peace. If you go and you find that person of peace and your peace rests on, you stay there because that's the one God's prepared. If people resist your spiritual conversations, the Bible tells you what to do. Dust your shoes off. Don't argue with people about your faith. It's not your job. Find people who are open and receptive. They not only will be open and receptive themselves, they will lead you to an entire group of people because they're a cultural insider. They may be a biker, they may be lesbian, they may be whatever, but they're open and receptive and they can lead you to a group. That group started Discovery Bible Study. By the way, you don't have to know much about the Bible. You don't really have to know anything about the Bible to be a disciple maker. You really don't. It's a good thing to learn about the Bible. I'm not saying it's not. But I'm telling you, if you don't know there's two testaments in the Bible, if you don't know how to read or write, you can be a disciple maker. And that's what I've observed. Ordinary people, you don't wait until they figure everything out. The very moment you come to faith in Jesus, that day you can be a disciple maker yourself. It's not your job. Let me release you from the responsibility of winning people to Jesus. It's not your job. John 6 says, no man comes to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draw him. And as the Scripture said, look at this in John 6, 45, they shall be taught by God. God's the teacher here. We don't need them to get dependent on us. If they ever get dependent on us, you know what they'll do? They'll just sit and listen to us the rest of their life. We need to get them dependent upon God where they know they themselves can get in the Bible and the Holy Spirit can speak to them through the Word and they can do it and they can multiply others to do it. That's what a Discovery Bible study is. If that resonates with you, if somehow the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about that, then come up here afterwards and see me. I will give you some material that talks about what this is. But I need to release you from the bondage of your responsibility to win people to Jesus. It's not. It's his responsibility, and he will use you. And if you don't even know there's 66 books in the Bible, no matter what you know or don't know, you can be a disciple maker, and I would be happy to show you how. Since our time in working with these partners in the Sahel, this very difficult region, over 2,500 churches have been planted, almost 5,000 discovery Bible study groups. Let me just introduce you real quick as we get close. Um, God has brought a team from the Fellowship Bible Church in Northwest Arkansas, uh, in Rogers, in Fayetteville, in Bentonville, Arkansas. Huge church there. Um, These guys and their families are taking over the responsibility in the Sahel from me. So that's releasing me to be more involved in the areas that are red. Nigeria, that's where this dress comes from, Nigeria. The Horn of Africa over there, you see Djibouti, Ethiopia, Eritrea, up in North Africa among the Arabs um, in Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, Mauritania. Um, Let me give you a surprise. I didn't get to this in the first service, and that's okay. Here's where it's coming back to the United States. There are groups that are now starting to use these simple biblical principles of kingdom advance and disciple-making movements. They're using them here in the United States. Gary Jennings with City Life in apartment complexes. It's amazing. The apartment complexes in the United States are the village of Africa. It's the same correlation. Nations in Chattanooga working with refugees and immigrants uh, in Africa on college campuses with Bridges International in Gordon Baines. Um, Up in uh, Hamtramck, uh, Michigan in, um, by the way, you at least have heard of Hamtramck, Michigan. It's the first city in the United States with a Muslim majority city council and a Muslim mayor. They're the ones that rejected having the pride flag being flown in June of this year, and they were national news because of that. There's a community garden 
a community farm up there that's being used. Um, in, on the streets of New Orleans among homeless people, uh, serving with purpose uh, and a ministry called City Life NOLA. We could keep going, but I will just say this. Areas that are reaching out in service to the communities now in the United States are saying, wait a second, we not only can serve, we can be disciple makers and church planters. Jacob Crawford can tell you the story of, of guys who were on the streets. They came to faith in Jesus. They got housing, and the housing that they got became their church. They planted a church on the streets. God can use you. There's one thing I wanted to accomplish today. Number one, to let you know that God is working in some of the most difficult context in the world, and he is. Two things under that. You can be a part of it if he's speaking to you. We're not going to have an invitation. I just want you to come over here when it's over and talk to me. You can give me some information. I'll give you some information. And if the Holy Spirit's dealing with you about that, please see me. And second of all, God can use this and what's needed in our culture. Honestly, folks, we, there's a whole demographic in the United States that is not going to come here. They're not, they've already checked out. They're not coming to a building. We've got to find a way to go to where they are, serve them, find people that God's dealing with, help disciple them, and see movement out there. If we don't, we risk losing our own culture. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people. I thank you for what you're doing here and the good things that I'm hearing. I thank you that we can sense that you're working in these people. And Father, I pray that you would do in their hearts and in their lives and what they've heard, not from me, but what they've heard from you. May they be obedient to that and may you bless them. Father, as Paul prayed in Ephesians, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. To him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen.
be magnified in my life, in my heart, so that I can make an impact on others around the world. Let's sing together. And I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. Sing it. 